I made the majority of the time in my living down on that trading floor when it was completely different. Uh, and the nature of the exchange space was really price discovery, uh, capital formation. That's the words you hear a lot of. And what we've evolved to this entire space is completely different. And it's much to John's point. Any business, anything that you're looking in, whether it's finance or not, things will for sure change. And nothing more abruptly than my career, which was um, really changed by technology. And that will be the theme, I think, of a number of the things you hear today. But let me tell you a little bit about the exchange space in general, uh, things that are going on today, how we all differentiate, and really how we've seen our business uh, change throughout the years. So as John hinted, uh, really, exchanges were really geographic centric. They were, this was a Chicago-based options exchange, born out of the Chicago Board of Trade. And then we have another big exchange. What's the name of the one across the street, John? Uh, CME, Chairman <laughs> The CME, which is huge in comparison to us, across the street. But we all had, you know, our geography, most of us in our name, New York Stock Exchange, Philadelphia Stock Exchange. And we, we were primarily one asset class. And what I mean by that is we traded derivatives on the security side of everything you can possibly think of listed underlying securities. So we traded IBM options. We Obviously, as the, as the market changed, we traded Google options. We broadened. We started trading broad-based index options, so like baskets of the S&P 500. NASDAQ, Russell, and the business grew, but we still stayed pretty centric to our core. We are run by our members, and we were running for the benefit of our members. So the profit and loss structure of exchanges was very much like a country club. Provide an opportunity for members to make money, transaction, transacting every day, whether it's by capturing the difference between the bid and the offer, or for a broker charging commission. And that was kind of the business model. And it, it lasted for years and years in that way. And the CME, one of the leaders in changing the dynamics of the exchange space, went for profit and then eventually public. And boy, did that change everything. Disrupted all the models, uh, the exchange models across the world. So a global change occurred. All exchanges, or, or, or more, those of their of some significant size, follow that for-profit model. Many of us went public, and we find ourselves today, the CBOE, as a publicly traded company, uh, trading broad asset class. We've not just traded the derivatives business that we started in, but we moved into US equities. We're the largest pan-European equity exchange. We trade foreign exchange, uh, and we uh, continue with our core business, obviously. But we're always looking for new because we know things are changing. And I think Chip's going to speak to digital currency as one of the topics as well. And CBOE has a rule filing pending with the CFTC, one of our regulators, to list futures on Bitcoin. So the, this, this entire space, unrecognizable from when John and I were using a reference when I was your age and got out of college, or, or many years before that when John did, uh, it, it is just completely changing. And that's the cool part of this business. So how can a floor trader end up in front of you as the chairman and CEO of a publicly traded company? It's just embracing that change, looking at the opportunities, and not being pigeonholed in that one idea I thought was really great at 21 or 22 years old. So this exchange and working for exchange, not only is it pretty exciting in the financial space, but let's just say your expertise is just in, in uh, accounting, marketing, legal. Uh, the breadth of the organization here and the divisions, we need everything. We continue to hire. We continue to look for talent. That is not going to change at all. And I think that's going to be the theme of all of the speakers that you hear today. The opportunities that were once very highly specialized in this space, this exchange space, or the financial space, now is incredibly broad and is because it's so dynamic, so so innovative and ever, ever changing. Just a question or two from any of you, uh, whether it's on the exchange space, the direction we're going in, what it means to have changed for a not-for-profit to a profit uh, organization, but anything that's interesting to you and or, or could just be a general question. Um, thanks for having us here. The question I have is, what do you think about the brokerage firms that 
So in charge commissions like Robin Hood coming into the marketplace? Uh, first of all, I think just in general, what the service that brokerage firms have, have provided to the investing community, whether it's commission free, uh, whether it's a partnership with the exchanges, we do a, a great deal of educational uh, cooperatives with uh, all brokerage, whether it's commission generating or not. The concept and the actual cost of your transaction, I would say, really isn't in the brokerage fee. So I think it's great uh, if someone's going to waive fees. I think that's terrific. But it is what we've all done as a complete, as a total industry on education. The smart investor is going to save way more than they ever can in their strategies getting into trades than they can ever save on commission. And similarly, with the, you had a couple, I think, trading firms outside. What has happened to the bid ask spread, which is really the cost of trading, the difference between the bid and the <laughs> offer, that compression has really made fees really inconsequential anyway. So I think it's terrific. Uh, I like the direction. I think it's fine. Um, but really, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that in a much more broader space. Look at, for example, what an E-Trade or Ameritrade or Fidelity or Schwab or the old Options Express did for education and bringing along a group of people that perhaps had never heard of a derivative who were trading just U.S. equities and broaden their scope, explain to them the basics of derivatives trading, for example, how to uh, increase returns by basic override strategy or protect a, a portfolio with protective put strategies. So look at the whole scope when you're choosing uh, your favorite online broker and, and look at uh, the entire offering and not just, oh, look, it's free, nothing against the free, but look at everything that you're being offered. I think you'll be pretty overwhelmed and satisfied with those that are still taking a, little, a couple pennies out of the commission schedule. Feel about some of the exchanges like trying to resist high frequency trading, like IEX, which is putting a like a three hundred millisecond yeah. buffer on all trades. Like that trend kind of that. Yeah. So if that's that's a really in the weeds question. I appreciate it because we we actually don't view IEX really as an exchange as much as an approved alternative trading system who happens to still have a speed bump and are chasing the speed bump. Most of the technology uh, advances in this industry, I believe, much to the compression of the bid-ask spread, have been for the benefit of the customer. So we actually embrace registered high-frequency traders. And I use that word registered because HFT <coughs> needs a branding campaign, right? All high-frequency trading is not bad. I would say the majority of it is actually positive and has been positive for the industry. So in general, we embrace the higher frequency trader. We like that they're registered because that comes with obligation. Those exchanges that are trying to carve out a little specialty area, IEX acting more like they did pre-approval like other ATSs. So it's an interesting model. Uh, it has not caught on in any great way. Uh, I think the uh, wonderful um, fiction book that was out that generated uh, the buzz around IEX. Most of those uh, attacks on high frequency traded were really misguided. Uh, so with a couple exceptions, right? All of the things that was accused are against most of the rules. We, we don't like front running. Front running we can surveil and find and that's, that's all bad stuff. But the majority of, uh, we think, uh, technology innovation and speed has been good and positive for the marketplace and participants. Do you think the future is more of an Yeah, I was asked that question 10 or 20 years ago uh, as we were changing. And we were going through, and John hinted, I was instrumental in changing us from a just 100% open outcry based trading floor to what we've, we use today, which is more of a hybrid model. We just bought an exchange, the BATS Global Markets, which was 100% uh, electronic. Uh, it's really simple. We took the philosophy when we built the system that we would not determine, nor would we encourage or discourage, whether open outcry or electronic trading. So when the utility in open outcry, the ability to walk in and ask your broker for a market, when the end user finds no utility in that offering, the trading floor will go away. The exchange, we're not set up to incent fees one way or the other, so it costs the exact same thing from our perspective. Uh, if you want to engage a broker or you just want to push a button and have your transaction uh, take place in, in split second. So uh, 
it's a long answer and a cop-out answer uh, to I, we're really not voting there. The end user is. And I will tell you what still remains on the trading floor, and you may have peeked down there before we began. It's really options on the S&P 500, a very expensive notional underlying, whose underlying security is across the street at the CME. It's VIX options, you know, the derivative of the derivative, right? So we're getting pretty complex here. And it's underlying security traded electronically on our futures exchange. So it really has become pretty specialized, complex trading and strategies that are still uh, uh, on the trading floor. Um, but it's like some of us, if you look at some of the things we're comfortable with clicking now and some that we aren't, I don't know how many people have bought a car. I still like trying to go in and get that last bit of price improvement from the sticker. Think of that the same way as a trading floor or a market that has some room in between the bid offer. I want to take that chance sometimes if I've got a large notional trade, just so I can do a little bit better than the posted price, right? So until that utility has gone, uh, we, might, we might end up like an airline you're just going to pick out. You can shop your price online and just say, yeah, sure, I'll buy it. So the evolution uh, as technology can satisfy the more complex orders, I think we're still, until that time, we'll still have a trading floor for negotiation. I believe uh, recently big banks have been like um, setting back on their revenue earnings from uh, trading, and they rely on more traditional like MA or IPOs. And we also have like J.P. Morgan um, betting on uh, traditional currency Bitcoin. Goldman Sachs, I think they're looking for to regulate trading Bitcoin. So do you see that the future of like the trading company moving from derivative for security to derivative for like digital currency? So a lot of questions in there. Uh, so the bank changing its revenue stream, a lot of that has to do with the division of trading as a principal or on behalf of, uh, of agent and or the amount of capital is required now all as a result of Dodd-Frank. So that, that in itself is about a, a two-hour lecture that John is way more capable than I. Uh, but looking at the different streams and uh, the comments that were made from J.P. Morgan specifically to Bitcoin, but not digital in general if you listen to his words, uh, we take a completely different view uh, than Jamie Dimon does and probably more like the majority of the street. First and foremost, we favor transparency in those markets and regulation and oversight. So the fact that the CBOE has partnered with Gemini, which is registered with the state of New York as a trust, so first registration. Second, that their processes will now fall under the CFTC because we're going to launch a future based on their auction settlement price. So if you, if you look at the theme and the theme of exchanges, it is bringing transparency and liquidity to the marketplace, which is otherwise not have it. So we think that those are looking for uh, Bitcoin in particular uh, exposure are well served by the transparency we can add going through the CFTC, a regulator, onto, the, uh, onto our electronic platform, our CFE, which trades each and every day. So we like that oversight. We can look into uh, regulation manipulation. We, we can do all of those services that we're charged to do as an exchange. That said, I think there will always be, from an exchange perspective, what's next. So this is just the what's next right now. And I don't want to take too much of Chip's fire. So I, I know he's dying to get into to digital with you. So I think with that, John, my time is probably up. And, and uh, I didn't want to front run your introduction to Chip, but I think he's going digital, right? Okay. Thank you all. Good to see you. Enjoy your time here.